Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Hello, my name is Mary Stevens. I grew up here at RUMC and have chosen to spend the next few years of my life working in missions. But the first thing I have to confess to you is I am a foodie. In fact, I could probably tell you my entire life story with only nicknames I received based on the foods I ate. <laughs> when I was in preschool here, I got the nickname Pizza Girl for bringing a pizza Lunchable every single day. <laughs> and then a few years later, I adapted a, a, a move for using my leftovers where I would save part of my meal and say, I'll eat it for breakfast. Just put an egg on it. <laughs> later on, I became the girl with the fancy salads. And over this past summer, during the quarantine period, I became ice cream mama for a lot of people living nearby. Most recently, though, I adapted the name Host of Gnocchi Nights. Gnocchi, haven't you heard of it? It's that potato pasta. It's pretty simple, a mixture of mashed potatoes and flour combined together, rolled out into these little dumpling-like shapes, then boiled. Once you boil it, you treat it like pasta and add your favorite sauces. So what is gnocchi night? Well, this originated from a South American cultural tradition. In fact, it usually takes place in Uruguay and Argentina, where on the 29th of every month, they celebrate gnocchi night. Basically, gnocchi is one of the cheapest meals they can make. And since the 29th is the day before they receive their paycheck, on that night, they make gnocchi. <laughs> so one of my friends studied abroad in Uruguay and came back with this tradition. And me, being a foodie, immediately was like, we must carry on this tradition. So sure enough, in January of 2019, we started celebrating Gnocchi Night on the 29th of every month. That meant on February 29th of 2020, we had to do a Gnocchi Night Extreme. After all, February 29th, it's a leap day. That means only once in every four years can we celebrate Gnocchi Night in February. So what does Gnocchi Night Extreme look like, you ask? Well, this meant instead of gathering 15 or 20 people in a small house, we met in our very large campus ministry house. We met and boiled so many potatoes and mashed them up and rolled them out. There were 50 plus people there. And in fact, it was so wonderful to be able to bring back the old sauces we'd used and some of our favorite recipes that had been side dishes. In addition to experiment with gnocchi dessert, which I'm not sure I would recommend, but Gnocchi s'mores, gnocchi apple crumble, how bad can it get? However, my most favorite part of Gnocchi Night Extreme was seeing the unique combination of people that were there. That night included some of my old high school friends, as well as one of my new friends' brother's friends. In other words, it was a unique gathering of people that wouldn't have come together otherwise. Now, the reason I'm speaking to you today probably isn't because I'm a foodie. But part of the reason might be because I love seeing gatherings of people. 
So let me introduce myself. Hi, I'm Mary Stevens, and you might recognize me. You might know me as the daughter of Eric and Cami Stevens, who have been a part of RUMC in the choir for longer than I've been alive. Or you might know me as one of your children's small group leaders, or kids zone leaders, or WOW choir directors. Or perhaps you recognize me as a student in one of your small groups or classes. <laughs> perhaps you recognize my name from the signature of an email asking for volunteers for all to your life. Or maybe you recognize my face from sitting in the pews of the Roswell UMC sanctuary many years and when I come home to visit my parents from college. Or you might not know me at all. <laughs> That's cool too. I have so many memories here. Roswell UMC is a special place. In fact, in this very room, the sanctuary, I remember coming to work with my mom a few times while she was working in the worship arts department. And my sister and I would run in here and then run around the balcony playing spy. <laughs> now spy was a game where we managed to duck and cover and roll and do as many spy moves as we could while trying not to alert anybody who might have been in the downstairs portion of the sanctuary. That sometimes included Tom Alderman playing on the organ or perhaps one of the AV guys working on the lights or sound in preparation for Sunday. But needless to say, I'm sure they didn't hear us. <laughs> but another one of my favorite memories was coming in during a Sunday night youth group and sitting in these pews and listening to Dr. Mike Long give his story of how he received his calling into ministry. I can't remember exactly my thoughts that night, but I think it was something along the lines of, yeah, cool, sounds good. I don't think I'll be going into ministry ever. <laughs> That's changed a little bit. I also remember a lot of All to Your Life weekends where we gathered in this space to worship together. I experienced reconciliation and callings from God, watching students come together and forgive each other and decide to renew friendships that had been broken. One of those memories in particular stands out, and I stood in the back of the room watching students worshiping, and I thought and prayed, God, can you just make them love you? Can you just make us love you? And it was like God whispered in my ear, like, no, I'll wait for them to come, but I always stand here open. I'll never forget that. And I believe that this moment too, speaking to you, will be another memory in the long list of meaningful moments in this space. So I'm really glad to be here. And I'm glad you're here listening too. And I hope that sometime in these next few minutes while I'm speaking, we form a new connection between you and I, or perhaps between you and the people you're watching with. But I also hope we experience a new connection with God. And with that being said, I would like to open up with some prayer. Lord, you are good, so good, and you have brought me through so many phases of life to this exact moment. And I trust that where we all stand and sit today, you are moving. Lord, let these words that I speak be from you and reach specific people who need to hear truth from you. God, thank you for your abundance in the way that you continually provide for us. So we call on you again to come and speak and let us know you are here. Amen. The word connection. It's one of my favorite words. I really like being connected to people. It allows me to feel this sense of belonging and a sense of importance that I long for. I imagine we all care. As being part of the RUMC community for so long, I was able to experience this connection in a really meaningful way. In fact, that's one of the reasons I was able to get to know Jesus and the love of Jesus because of the way that different people here showed me that love. <laughs> it takes a village after all, or at least a church. So when I graduated from high school in 2016 and became a student at Georgia Tech, I knew I was going to need a community. That meant when I arrived to Georgia Tech, I went searching for a Christian campus ministry. 
I wanted friends and groups of people who would accept me as I am and also push me more towards Jesus in hopes that they too were trying to get closer to Jesus. I found that community at Georgia Tech CCF, which stands for Christian Campus Fellowship. It was there that I saw Jesus embodied in the students and the way that they emphasize community that accepts all people, but does that because Jesus is at the center. (laughs) I met a new friend this year, and I think he described CCF quite well. In fact, he wrote a song, and when he finished performing the song for us, he said, This is what I think about CCF, but I think it's what you believe about Jesus. And I'm not sure what I believe about Jesus right now, but I really do love CCF. I want to share with you a few of his lyrics. He said, It's something that ends the pointless roam, something that's always more than enough and something that helps when times are tough. Yeah, that sounds like love to me. It sounds a lot like Jesus. And it's so encouraging for me to hear that a ministry I've been involved in for a long time has been able to teach someone else about who Jesus is without using words necessarily, but merely actions and acceptance. CCF taught me a lot too. It taught me that my faith is more than just a personal relationship with Jesus, but also a connection with people around me who are also seeking Jesus. As a result of the meaningful moments I had at CCF, I chose to be an intern. That means that when I graduated from Georgia Tech in May, I decided to work at CCF for a year. So right now, I'm serving in my eighth month as an outreach intern at CCF at Georgia Tech. That means I spend most of my time talking with students about faith and life and how those two coincide. It also means that I spend some of my time planning outreach events, going out and doing tie-dye or playing human-sized ping pong just to meet new people and invite them into community. And occasionally, it means I sit on the couch in the ministry house and just get to watch. Watch as Jesus becomes real through the students who are talking, or working, or serving, or humbly giving of themselves in relationships. As a part of my experience at CCF, I received the invitation to work and study abroad in Santiago, Chile. In Santiago, there's a ministry called El Oasis, which is one of 14 other campus ministries around the world that are part of a program called Global Scope. Global Scope was basically the baby of CMF, a Christian Missionary Fellowship, and CCF at Georgia Tech to produce campus ministries around the world that create dynamic communities for students of all different walks of life and faith to meet Jesus. While I was there for my semester, I took classes and I also worked at this campus ministry. And I learned a lot of things. (laughs) That semester changed my life. One of the things I learned is that churches hurt a lot of people. And because of that, a lot of people turn away from God because they don't ever know Jesus. But the second thing I learned is that community heals a lot of that hurt. The third thing I learned hit home to me personally and that one of my greatest weaknesses is that I lean on my confidence and not on the grace of God. But the fourth thing I learned is that I have a calling because my heart aches for all people to feel like they belong simply because and wonderfully because they are a child of God. That means it doesn't matter what they believe or what they've done, how they've succeeded or failed or how they identify, but because God created them they are accepted into this space. And I want to create spaces for people to belong and experience Jesus' love because of their identity as a child of God. Because of that calling, I have decided to move to Vigna de Mar, Chile, where there is now a second El Oasis campus ministry. And I'll be joining the team there this fall and working there for four or more years 
as I serve alongside of Chileans and Americans to create this dynamic community space for people to belong and meet the love of Jesus along the way. Clearly, community has allowed me to know Jesus more and more. It makes me love Jesus because if people can be this good, I can't imagine how the Son of God in human form can be, oh, so, so good. And so I want to talk about Jesus. I love this story in Matthew's Gospel. He uses a few verses of Scripture to encompass all of Jesus' earthly ministry. So today I'm going to read from Matthew 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So when I lead Bible studies at the campus ministry, I often ask students after reading the verses, what stands out to you? So I read these verses and asked myself and a few friends, what stands out to you? One of the biggest things we talked about is Jesus' compassion. He sees, he notices, and then he responds. He chooses to do something about it. He saw their state of being. It makes me wonder, what does that look like to be harassed and helpless? I think of a story of one of my friends. Her name is Yessi. And while I was studying abroad in Chile, I met her because she wanted to learn English. As we got to know each other, I learned that a lot of her history in the church is one of rejection and judgment. Because when she was little, she attended a church with her family, but because of the way she was spiritually perceiving things happening in the world, her pastor accused her of being cursed and judged her and asked her to leave the church. In fact, when I met Yessie, she was at the point in her faith where she had decided that God did not want anything to do with her, that he had no plans for her life, and no interest knowing her more as a person. And so she decided to turn away from God and keep walking about her life because she didn't want to follow a God who had no interest in her. Boy, did God have different plans for her, though. He did not want her moving at all with that belief because he does, in fact, have an intentional plan and a good plan for her life. In fact, in the past three years that I have known Yessie, I've seen her be accepted and welcome an acceptance in a Christian community and to welcome Jesus into her life as her Lord and Savior. And now she's even planning to go on and do missions in Thailand in a college campus ministry for a few months. It's so wonderful to know that there is healing even in that harassed and helpless state. In fact, it's quite common in the Jewish history for this situation to happen, for people to be harassed or helpless or sheep without a shepherd. It's referred to many times in Old Testament scripture. And I believe it's something we experience in our own lives, perhaps through the disappointment of a mentor or a leader who isn't all that you thought they were. Or perhaps it was a parent who disappointed you or a friend who didn't stick to their word. So here we stand, harassed, helpless, weary, worn, tired, and disappointed. And Jesus has compassion on you. He has compassion on me. But what comes next? See, because in the Gospel of Matthew, there's always something familiar that happens, and then Matthew's like, Oh, hold on. That is not how Jesus actually is. Jesus says something entirely opposite to what you already thought. In fact, in this situation, I got really confused because Jesus sees them. 
he says they're harassed and helpless. He has compassion on them. They're tired. And then he says, the harvest is plentiful. We need more workers. Go do the work, right? That's confusing. If they're tired and Jesus has compassion, then why isn't he allowing them to rest? Why is he asking them to go do work? Or maybe you're wise and paid attention and caught a key detail, the harvest. In my personal experience, I've never worked on a farm. In fact, the closest I've ever gotten is to picking apples, you know, where you get a giant bushel and you have to fill the, the bucket with apples and after like 30 minutes of lugging that around, I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> so when I hear harvest and going to work harvest, that sounds like a lot of work. But I was listening to a podcast about this scripture from Bema Discipleship, and they pointed out a key detail that to the Jewish audience, the word harvest coincides with the word abundance. In fact, the only place in the Old Testament where harvest and work go hand in hand is in the story of Ruth. I love the story of Ruth. It talks about a man named Boaz who generously allows Ruth to follow behind the workers in the field to collect what they've dropped behind in their harvest. What I love about this is it was through Boaz's grace that he allows Ruth, who had not earned that grain, to collect the grain. And it shows that Ruth was not there because he needed her, but simply because there was already an abundance of grain. That's the good news for us today. There is an abundance of grain. We are invited to that grain. In fact, in merry terms, so back to food, of course. I imagine this being like a large party where you get there and you see there's food everywhere. But then you realize it's a potluck and you were supposed to bring something. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, I believe I would take a plate and start with small amounts and come back later and see how much food was still there. But we all know how that story ends. There's always enough food, and so you end up eating your fill and probably more than your fill and leaving quite satisfied. Except I've never done that. I don't know about you, but I find it really difficult to accept things that I haven't earned or to accept a gift before I've offered my own gift. This got me thinking. Perhaps I constantly find myself harassed and helpless because I feel like I haven't done enough to accept the invitation to work at the harvest. After all, I misread this scripture. I saw it as a call to action. As soon as Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, we need workers, I started strapping on my boots, putting on my clothes, getting ready to go plant seeds in this barren field to prepare the harvest. I mean, Jesus, you're right. There is so much work to be done. We need more people. Let me do more. But no, listen. Jesus asks the Lord to send workers to the harvest. The harvest is already there. One of my favorite things about campus ministry is free food. In fact, I think Jesus was aware that free food was going to be a great technique for ministry because of the sacrament of communion. After all, worse comes to worse, if the church fails, at least people will keep coming for the free bread and wine. <laughs> I digress. But within campus ministry, free food is one of the best forms of being the hands and feet of Jesus. This reminds me of a great story. While I was in Chile studying abroad, I was talking with this new student who had just come to the ministry earlier this week for the first time and was back on a Thursday night for our regular Bible study dinner and worship event. I was talking with him, welcoming him back in, and we were standing out in the patio Usually in the patio, we have a time of welcome and of prayer, but this was just before that. And he noticed that dinner was getting ready to be served. He looks over to me, concerned. Uh, how much was I supposed to pay for this? I, and I cut him off. 
oh, nothing, it's free. And he said, oh, so I have to pay later. Do you know how much it's going to be? I was like, no, no, it's, it's free. But again, he asked, oh, do I need to do some kind of work? Is this a commitment? I'm not sure. And I was like, no, it's totally free to you because there are people in the United States or in other countries who care about this ministry and have given money so that you can eat for free, so that you can feel like nothing holds you back from joining this place. <laughs> he looked back at me. En serio? <laughs> like, are you serious? Wow. It's such a beautiful message to explain grace in such simple terms. Here is something. I freely give it to you. It's been paid for by someone else. But because I love you, it is a gift. That's what God says to us. That's the invitation of grace. He says, Jesus has taken care of it. Accept the gift. Accept the harvest. But as I've said, it is really hard for me to accept that gift. After all, if I have trouble accepting free food from humans, how on earth am I going to receive free grace from God? Good news. The Holy Spirit is certainly working with me, working on me and in me. So I'm trying to join the harvest. Often, I'm still a sheep. I find myself in that helpless state, lost and unsure. But Jesus' invitation stands. Join the harvest. For me, sometimes joining the harvest looks like dancing when there's no reason. Sometimes it means I'm resting, even when the to-do list is impossibly long. Right now, a lot of joining the harvest is receiving donations from people who want to support my mission in El Oasis, even when I haven't done anything to earn that money. And sometimes joining the harvest is just enjoying a slow walk, getting to notice the budding trees, and the singing birds. Sometimes it's accepting invitations to preach a sermon that I might not be qualified for, or to share a meal, or tell a story in a conversation. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers to the harvest field. Ask. We must keep asking. And keep praying for God to send people, his people, to the harvest. Yes. But I also believe that many people before us have prayed that prayer. And so I believe that we are called to join the harvest as an answer to their prayer. I hope to join the harvest in Chile. And for now, I am trying to enjoy the harvest at Georgia Tech. And along the way, I hope to invite everyone I meet. So, here I am with you today. I invite you. Join the harvest. And if you meet someone along the way, invite them to come too. Will you pray with me? Lord, Again, we come to you acknowledging that your blessings go far beyond anything we can hope or imagine. Lord, you have created this harvest field and you invite us not because you need more workers, but because there is an abundance of grain to be consumed, to be enjoyed, to be celebrated. God, thank you for this time today, for us to come together and hear this truth and to renew our intention of accepting your freely given gift of grace. God, guide us, help us, show us the opportunities to celebrate the harvest. It's in your name we've gathered, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock 
and 1115 AM. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.